Our first scripture lesson today is found in the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. Listen now for God's word to you in this reading of scripture. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live at a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. For the word in creation, for the word in scripture, for the word within us. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of Luke. I'm reading from the 23rd and 24th chapters of Luke. The closing chapters of the uh, closing verses of the 23rd chapter. And then the story of what we now call that first Easter coming from the 24th chapter. Let us listen for God's word in Luke's telling of the story. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea and he was waiting expectedly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women with them who told this to the apostles. These words seemed to them an idle tale, 
and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. For the word in creation, for the word in scripture, and for the word within us. Thanks be to God. How many times have you heard that story? What, what can we say different about that story this morning? You know, this is always a dilemma on Easter and also at Christmas time too. These stories are so familiar to us. And we have heard them so many times. As a matter of fact, uh, Peg and I started counting last night and, and counting a couple of sunrise services that I've done. This will be my 29th Easter sermon. 29 times I've delivered a sermon on this story. Now, Thank God we have at least four versions of it. And that every year we're dealing with another version of it, but we're always recycling the different versions. So basically we're always dealing with the same story. 29 times. I have to tell you, the first two got me into trouble. I know you find that hard to believe. But the first one, I was a seminary student and in a church that we were attending uh, there in the, the community of, at Col around Columbia Seminary was having a sunrise service. And they always like to invite a seminarian to do the sunrise service. It was a great honor for the seminarian. I since have learned it's because the pastor didn't want to do that early service. So I gave a sermon and, and I, I put together some of my, my dramatic background and I preached a sermon that was basically, what would it be like if you were the one that walked up to the tomb? Soon after the sermon was over, a lady came up to me and said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself plagiarizing Peter Marshall like that. I went, what? It was word for word. I know it. Well, I, I looked it up and I found out, yeah, Peter Marshall had had a sermon where he did a similar thing. Of course, it wasn't word for word. It just goes to show that if people have the same ideas and I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to get accused of plagiarizing, Peter Marshall ain't bad. <laughs> now, the second one, when I got into trouble was after I had become the pastor in this small community of Forsyth, Georgia, and we had a big community sunrise service. And I got the honor of preaching there as the newest minister in town. I soon learned that that wasn't so much of an honor either. So I delivered my Easter sunrise service with all of my newly acquired seminary education. And I used a rhetorical technique that laid out all of the things that the resurrection is not before I presented what the resurrection is. Unfortunately, most people never got past the knots. 
And the next week in that tiny community, the word on the street was that new Presbyterian pastor doesn't believe in the resurrection. So I learned early that you got to try to stick with the story. And even though we have four different versions of it, it's really the same story. And there are three elements in all four versions of the telling of the resurrection. And we have those three elements, of course, in our telling this morning. And the three elements that are in all four accounts are a stone, a boulder that has been rolled away, an empty tomb, and women are the first to go to the tomb and the first to proclaim the good news of Easter. Those three things are in all four stories. Now in the synoptic gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, we also have uh, an illusion, a, a vision of light in that empty tomb. It gets described as young men dressed in white. But the language is much more ambiguous than this. It's a shining figure or two shining figures who tell the women that Jesus is no longer in the tomb, that Jesus has risen. Now there's a fourth element that is true in all four stories of the resurrection, and that is the resurrection of Jesus is not witnessed. It is not witnessed, it is proclaimed. It's an important thing for us to know. The resurrection of Christ is not witnessed, it is proclaimed. And what it gets proclaimed is the tomb is empty, he is not here. We heard this morning a little context for the Luke version of the resurrection. I, I wanted to give us just a little bit of the context of what actually took place before the resurrection. Just in case some of you were not in Monday, Thursday or Good Friday services, which I'm sure all of you were. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is dead. Let me say that again. Jesus is dead. His body is taken down from the cross. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea ask. He's a, he's a member of the council that voted to charge Jesus, but he didn't agree with that vote. And he comes and he asks for the body and he takes Jesus' body into his own tomb, which we assume was probably going to be his tomb. And the women who had come with him from Galilee, they get listed later on in the resurrection story. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Joanna. These women come with Joseph of Arimathea because, and the story is clear about this, they need to know where Jesus is laid because they will be coming back 
with the spices and the ointments that they will prepare. And so they go with Joseph so they know where the tomb is. So it's important, I think, for us to, to, to know this part of the story and to talk about this part of the story on Easter morning. We come into worship on Easter morning and the first thing we say is, Christ is risen. When in actuality, the first thing on Christmas morning is Christ is dead. Jesus has died. And then the women come to the tomb to prepare the body. And the stone is rolled away. You know, last week we talked about stones, didn't we? As Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on that day that we call Palm Sunday, he was told to tell his followers to be quiet. And Jesus said, if they were quiet, even the stones would shout out. All of creation proclaims the glory of God, the presence of God. Even the rocks, the dirt, everything. And then the very first thing that happens is a stone lets us know that the tomb is empty. The boulder is rolled away. The stone has opened the grave. We don't know how that happened. Nobody does. It wasn't witnessed. What we do know is when the women arrive, the stone is rolled away. And so in a way, the stone itself is proclaiming the empty tomb. And the women go in and they discover that the body of Jesus is gone. The tomb is empty. And that's when we have this vision of light and this voice that says, He is not here. In our version this morning, it says, He is not among the dead. He is among the living. It's a direct reference back to some of Jesus' own teachings. When he talks about the resurrection, when he talks about the afterlife, he says, God is a God of the living, not of the dead. Which is a broad reference to an understanding of what eternal life is you see one of our one of our difficulties one of our problems in stories like the resurrection in stories like christmas some of these familiar stories that we hear all the time one of our problems with these stories is that we have become so accustomed to hearing about jesus rather than listening to Jesus. We have become so accustomed to believing intellectually in Jesus instead of following the teachings of Jesus. We have these stories about the resurrection but what does Jesus have to say about resurrection? Well, if we really want to know, we have to go back into 
when Jesus was living among his disciples and when he was teaching and when he was healing when he was preaching Jesus tells us time and again time and again in numerous ways that resurrection is about us. We come to church on Easter morning thinking that resurrection is about Jesus. And Jesus keeps telling us, no, no, no. It's about you. How many times do I have to say it? I have come to give you life. I come to show you the way. God is in me and I am in God and we are in you. You are filled with the Spirit. You will have eternal life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about us. It's not about him. And he tells us this. If we bother to read the story, instead of hanging on to what we've been told about the story. And so we come here on an Easter morning Wanting to know about the resurrection of Jesus. But it's really about us. And it's about our death. And the many deaths that we experience in our lives. The losses. The rejections. The failures. The disappointments. It's about all of those things. It's about all of those times when we thought it was the end of the world, but it really wasn't. It's about all those times when we thought, I can't live without something or somebody, and we find out we can. It's just in a different way. Because you see, the risen Christ is not Jesus of Nazareth. It's the embodiment and the presence of Christ, the eternal Christ in each and every one of us, which is another thing Jesus told us, but we just don't hear it. He was asked flat out, when will we know you, Jesus? And he says, you'll, you'll know me in the least of these. When you encounter someone in need, When you are in need, that's where you're going to find me. And we discover that all of these deaths, even our ultimate death, is actually an illusion. Because there is no end. Life is eternal. Eternity, that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Most of us say eternity and we think future. Eternity has no beginning and it has no end. Eternity is, is everything, all the time, everywhere, in every time. And if we have eternal life... That means life that has no beginning and has no end. And we have that eternal life because we have the presence of Christ in us, which is the presence of God from the beginning and to the end, of which there is neither, because they come together as the Alpha and the Omega. It's a great mystery of Easter. 
that's not really a mystery at all. It's a reality. That Easter's about us. Now, if we can get to this place, that Easter is about us, then what do we do? Then it's about how we live. And then again, we listen to Jesus. So I would encourage us this morning to think about Easter in terms of our own lives, not an event that happened 2,000 years ago to Jesus of Nazareth. And it's not about the resuscitation of a dead body. It's about God doing a new thing in each and every one of us all the time. I want to read something that I read just this morning in a daily reading I get by email from Richard Rohr. A paragraph in that reading says, Brothers and sisters, if we don't believe that every crucifixion, war, poverty, torture, hunger, can somehow be redeemed, who of us would not be angry, cynical, hopeless? No wonder Western culture seems so skeptical today. It all doesn't mean anything. It's not going anywhere because we weren't given a wider cosmic vision of Jesus' resurrection. Easter is not just the final chapter of Jesus' life, but the final chapter of history. Death does not have the last word. Life is eternal. Your life, my life. And my friends, that is the good news of Easter. Amen. The women went back and told the others And they believed it to be an idle tale. You know, I think that may be one of the best descriptions of a large portion of the church. Do we really believe any of this stuff? Do we really pay attention to what Jesus says to us? Frederick Bickner says, the earliest reference to the resurrection is St. Paul's. And he makes no mention of an empty tomb at all. But the fact of the matter is that in a way it hardly matters how the body of Jesus came to be missing because in the last analysis what convinced the people that he had risen from the dead was not the absence of his corpse but his living presence. And so it has been ever since. That is true. Until we experience the risen Christ in our lives and in the world, it is an idle tale. We're going to do the traditional Easter greeting in about 10 seconds, but I'm going to change it. I'm going to say, Christ is risen, and you're going to say, 
Christ is risen in me. Same cadence, right? Are you ready? Christ is risen, Christ is risen in me. And that, my friends, is reason for us to sing with the music that you have in your pews. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.